Hello, I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, any beliefs that a March Mardi Gras date would be warm were dispelled as celebrants shivered to what was nevertheless a successful carnival. We'll look at some of the top news stories of the season. And while many maskers dressed as blind referees, we'll hear what Gail Benson has to say about the no call heard around the world. Elsewhere, we will hear about a prolonged oil leak in the Gulf, the LSU basketball head coach suspended, and the dangers of bicycle lanes. Plus, our Future Watch segment looks at the RTA and the status of streetcar and ferry service. On board for us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Aboard, producer of Informed Sources, David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Bo Evans, reporter, NOLA.com, The Times Picayune. And we're going to go over to Errol first. Another Mardi Gras season come and gone, and it was a good one, kind of chilly, but thanks. It was very Mardi successful, Gras and I mean, Mardi Gras does so much, it has such a huge economic impact. I think even more important is the impact it has on the community in terms of uniting the community. And I always mention at the end of the year, when people do end of the year reviews, they always forget about Mardi Gras and the significance mm -hmm. that it had. But it's really one of the important events every sure year with, uh, uh, within the season, especially that, that, that last week or so of Carnival. I was just thinking through some of the, uh, I guess, the, the, the important news stories. And the first thing that comes to mind, of course, was the fire of the, of the, at the house on uh, St. Charles Avenue, which is important to Mardi Gras. It has uh, a long Mardi Gras history with the families that have uh, lived there. Something I learned, I have always heard of that house. It has many names. It's known as the Cock House and the Downman House in the Grace and in the Grace House. But in the week of the fire, the people who lived in the neighborhood always referred to it as the Rex House. Mm -hmm. And I never heard it uh, referred to as that, but I guess it is because uh, Rex uh, would always stop and toast at that house and still did. And so, uh, and the family has promised that they're going to bring it back. I did notice that the couple that uh, that lives there that they were both at the Rex Ball the other night, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so and I, and I Bill guess Grace. that shows that yeah, that they're, uh, yeah, yeah, Bill Grace and his wife. So, um, and then of course Mrs. Montgomery too, and yeah, mom. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't notice if she was there or not, but, the, but, but I know the, the Greases were. The other thing was the story with uh, with Zulu that that kind of caught itself, that caught up in this whole blackface argument. And Zulu stood his ground and said, this isn't blackface, this is makeup. This is, you know, we're trying to depict, depict the Zulu warriors. And, and they stood their ground. And, uh, and I thought that that was good that they did that. I heard someone a couple to... national broadcasts on that. They just missed the story completely. They yeah. did not understand. And then they're trying to explain what a Zulu is. And it just, <laughs> yeah. it didn't go over well nationally. Yeah, well, national doesn't always understand those things. But uh, I think the people... Uh, in Zulu did. The other thing was the expansion, the, the growing participation of, of women in, in Mardi Gras. Uh, we saw that with the, uh, the crew of Iris uh, uh, grew by a large number this year. They, they had a, a new float builder and they got more floats. And then we've seen uh, uh, Nicks and Muses, uh, which already uh, are a huge number. And you see more and more women's walking groups. And with the expansion of Carnival out into Marini, that I don't know the exact number. I don't even know if it's possible to count. But it, as far as the people in the street, there may be as many women as there are uh, men are participating. If not, it's certainly gotten a, a lot closer. Iris had great throws this year. Okay. They well, were really throwing a lot. There you go. Okay. And, you know, it used to be it was like a cliche. People would say, oh, the women parades, they don't, they don't throw very much. And now here we are saying, hey, they're throwing a lot, you know. And, so <laughs> and don't forget there, there are men marching, I mean, walking groups, rolling groups, too, yeah. like the Lacey mm -hmm. Boys and the yeah. Alvine. And for one thing I understand, the fact that you have so many subgroups now is creating, like, good networking among women when something else happens, like an iris is expanding. And so there's kind of a communication system um, that's developed. And then don't forget, Tux has men and, and women. women. And oh, two yeah. of us ride. Well, there's always been crews that have had both <coughs> men and women, but, but, but especially the, the growth of the all-female all crews has been just uh, uh, very impressive. Uh, a significant change with the Rex organization in that they announced that after this year that they're changing float builder from Blaine Kern, mm -hmm. who's been doing it like for 60 years and going to this uh, company called uh, Royal Artists. Uh, and, and another thing, at, at their ball, for the first time ever, the symphony was the band at uh, the Rex Ball. They've never played a carnival ball before, and it was a different, um, a different sound. And, and a good sound, too. But, and then the other, the other story was the weather. Uh, the weather teased, it challenged, all we, it looked like it was going to be bad, but at the last moment. And some credit to the weather forecasters, because they were able to say 
several days ahead of time, there's going to be bad weather until 6 o'clock. Okay? And then, I mean, they were able to predict the time, right. and so I think they did a good job. And in the end, there was only one parade in Orleans that was uh, canceled, and that was the chaos parade. And they had other reasons to cancel besides the weather. And so uh, uh, ultimately, I think modern forecasting really helped make that more forecasting successful. Forecasting and then also whoever made the call to, at first, on that last Friday, um, to uh, make the parade say, okay, we're going to go a little bit earlier, like a half hour earlier. Then they said, no, wait, we'll go we're a little go bit later. later at 7 o'clock. So the forecasting also helped the planners make the decision. They were able to have that kind of information mm -hmm. to be able to make that kind of decision. And crews like and, Toth then yeah. rolled with just their floats and no walking right. groups and no bands so that they could get off the street fast. And I remember last Friday night, if you listened to the, to the predictions all day, it sounded like it was going to be awful. And there was some bad rain that came in. But by the time the parades were there, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a nice night. And so, uh, you, yeah, the forecast was very good. Also, another thing, too, I mean, I, I, you guys rode, both of you guys rode um, tux. The, yes. the, so you went down St. Charles. Did you see a lot of tents? More tents than in the past? I That's what I'm hearing from I ride on the folks. sidewalk side, not the neutral ground side, so which is where the tents think. usually are. So I did not see Did any. you notice that? Would I you remember think? being many more tents mm -hmm. than previously. Napoleon always has a lot yeah. of tents. Yeah. Well, yeah, Napoleon also well, used to have on, a lot of sofas and, yeah. and stuff <laughs> folks would bring out there. I was on the streets, yeah, and there were a lot of tents. A lot of tents, well, but on the, the neutral ground. Well, on, not on the, yeah, St. yeah, yeah, on the neutral ground. It's kind of like shelters. It's not really a... A full tent, but with these shelters, but there's a, a lot of those, a lot of big group parties, and that's okay. I mean, it's good to have a cluster of people. I tell you, the real danger along St. Charles is people who are walking down the street, and when they're walking down the street, they're looking at their iPhones, mm -hmm. they're reading that, okay, and they're not paying attention the to the phones, traffic. Yeah. That's what that's the real danger. But overall, good morning. Overall, it's a good morning. I got to give a shout out to the downtown, Marigny, French Quarter stuff too. I mm -hmm. mean, one de Gras with. Red Beans and some of the other walking crews. And then Mardi Gras Day down on Frenchman was pretty yeah, nice. That's really now quite the, the spot, too, for Mardi Gras all over the city. Well, and, and the Society of St. Anne, which, you yeah. know, which is great, it, it always starts in Marigny and works its way right. through and then goes into the French Quarter. So and folks, yeah, of course, that's a good scene. enjoy themselves in Jefferson Parish, too. Don't forget about the J.P. Mardi Gras. And Gras in well. Homa and everywhere yeah, else. Yeah. So. All right. Wait now for the next year. All right, we're going to go over to Bo right now. I mean, one thing that truly was a horrific accident, you know, during this Mardi Gras season was the bike accident that happened on Esplanade Avenue with a driver plowing into a group of bicyclers, and um, most of those injured were, were on their bicycles. Two people were killed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's now, you know, once again, a focus on how safe are these bike lanes? What can we do to make them safer? Um, yeah, it, there was a crash involving a driver um, who it, it's getting close to determining whether he was drunk or not. I mean, mm -hmm. it, all the signs are there that he was. We just don't have any sort of blood tests or he refused a breathalyzer at the scene. Um, but basically, what, from what the police say, he swerved into the lane and then uh, the bicycle lane and hit several people, killed two of them. And, and, and now what, you know, people, some bicycle advocates now are talking about, you know, what can you do? And New Orleans right now um, is kind of catching up with a lot of cities in um, r really pro proliferation of more bicycle mm -hmm. lanes. Um, there have been um, like 100 miles uh, installed in the last uh, five years or something like that around that time period. And, there's, and they're talking about doing even more um, going forward. And, and so there is this conversation that unfortunately, you know, gets brought to the mm -hmm. the, to inter, the, the energized yeah. surface when things like this happens, but bicycles in this city are are a very passionate subject nowadays. But um, no, I find those lanes to be problematical myself. I was uh, I was driving down Carrollton Avenue, and all of a sudden there's a bicycle lane, and so I don't know. Can I drive in the, in the bicycle line so lane? So the inclination was to move over to the left. Which could have right there caused an accident right there. Said move, or is it okay to be straddling the bicycle lane? It, it doesn't seem like a street like Carrollton could really have room for cars in the bicycle lane. Yeah, I mean that's the challenge right now for people working in city government. Um, some of these groups like Bike Easy, which is uh, you know looks at this, is is where do you put these bicycle lanes in this city or in any city? Uh, but particularly with this one where we have bad roads, we have. Uh, <laughs> we have roads that were built as horse carriage paths. They're you know, not the, really very yeah, wide. Yeah, the, the way that the city is laid out, you have a lot of narrow streets, mm -hmm. and and you know you, you 
other cities have things like bicycle boulevards where they pick some of the you know the the less traversed streets well, no, and they I mean, use them for cars. We have the Lafitte bicycle. Greenway, yeah. you know, not for cars, but I mean that's for bicycles, but like a place on Esplanade. Right. They're clearly marked, there's a clearly marked bike lane and now the, the traffic, the automotive traffic has to stay to the left, yeah. bike lane to the right. What some biking uh, supporters are saying, look, why don't you move, you know, the parked cars to the outside, let the, yeah. the, the bikes travel along the curb, that way there would be a buffer. And there was a test done on that um, mm -hmm. along Barone Street. Do we know what was the, yeah, what the findings <coughs> of that? So what the idea with this is, is that you move, the bicycle lane is already there, um, and you move it to the curb side, mm -hmm. right? As close to the curb as you can get. And between the bicycle lane and the vehicle lane, you have a parking lane. Um, this is something that, according to folks I talked to, a lot of bicyclists love this because you have a buffer there mm -hmm. with the parked lane. But um, you know, it, it from what from me talking to people and feedback that we get, it causes problems for people who are parked there, and also some a lot of things that I hear that, you know, it, if you have a delivery truck that's mm -hmm. trying to go in a bicycle lane, that's a problem too. It also, if you're trying to park there, I experienced this at Barone yeah. Street, mm -hmm. say you're getting out of the car getting with someone who needs a, a wheelchair or a small child who needs to be buckled in and out, the people in the parked car are now not, don't have the safety of the sidewalk that's and right. they could get hit on one side by the, the cars going by or on the other side mm -hmm. by the bikes coming past. So right. it's not safe for the parked cars either. So, so, so what Bike Easy was really kind of spearheading this and in, in conjunction with the city uh, and they told me that they're going to have uh, some sort of like a report um, on this pilot mm -hmm. program right. on Barone Street. Well, so it's a challenge that has to be met because we are seeing a real uptick in bicycle riders. Yeah, I was listening the to the radio today. Somebody said that was talking about how we just don't have, we should just shouldn't have any bicyclists, and and I think it was Scoot had said, well, the genie's already out of the bag. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've you got know. blue bikes all over the place, and people are using them too. All, all right. righty, thanks a lot. Thanks. Bro. Over to David now, and there has been some oil leaking in the Gulf for the past 15 years from uh, capsized uh, Taylor Energy. Rig. So, right. what what's going on with that? I mean, when is it going to be stopped? Yeah. Well, it could be getting stopped as we speak. There's crews out there doing some new things that haven't been done at this exact level with the Coast Guard's involvement. But it's something that they tried before and it failed. So this is a Taylor Energy uh, platform. So that's a static platform that's stationary, not one of these moving vessels. Mm -hmm. And it was connected to 25 oil wells in 450 feet of water about 10 miles off the tip of Louisiana. And Hurricane Ivan blew through and caused a mudslide and knocked the thing down. And when it did that, a bunch of the wells were leaking and it was under this like oatmeal-like sediment on the mm -hmm. bottom way down there and it was really hard to figure out what was going on. They went in, Taylor Energy did, and drilled intervention wells, which means they go in and drill new wells to intercept the old wells and cut them off and plug them, but they were only able to safely do nine out of the 25. So that left 16 that were open. They thought that those were not leaking and that it was just trapped oil under there that was slowly leaking out. And there are you know, thousands of oil spills, small ones in the Gulf every year. They're not all like the Deepwater Horizon back in 2010 that had 1.5 million gallons of oil coming out every day. But what we've found out with this one is that 15 years in or 14 and a half years into it, all of a sudden now it's being cast as much larger of a spill than Taylor and the government had been willing to admit for years and years and years. And so that's totally changed the paradigm. It's got national attention. And now the Coast Guard is scrambling like it's an emergency, you know, uh, a 15 year old emergency that they've got to get this thing capped. And so they're trying that now, which is actually deploying something called a containment dome, which is like a cap that they put down there, down at the base, and try to capture the oil and siphon it off and get it to, uh, out of the water. The problem is they haven't even tried really over the years to get the stuff that's come to the surface. And what uh, various scientists have found is that it's a lot more than what Taylor has been reporting. I went out there with a Taylor crew out on a, a plane and got a good look at it. It is not by any means the Deepwater Horizon mm -hmm. spill. And part of the problem is that you've got 
this new paradigm and this new discussion nationally that it could be larger than the BP spill, and it's really comparing apples to oranges. Over 15 years, Over the amount 15 of 15 years. years, slowly <clears throat> leaking, but even that is probably not even close mm -hmm. to true. So it's somewhere in between. It's a lot bigger than just a natural seep that you'd see out there on a regular basis, and it needs to be taken care of. And just last week, there was a court hearing in federal court where Judge Ivan Lamel said, hey, First of all, Coast Guard, what took you so long? Why haven't you been able to figure this out over 15 years? And Taylor, why not just say, hey, we tried, we did our best, let somebody else do it? Well, Taylor has been, in the interview that I saw that you did with the head of Taylor, said, you know, we have been working at this. It's not like we just turned our backs to it and didn't address it. But here's part of the problem that is really the larger issue here, is that the system is set up to deal with oil spills by having the government and the responsible oil company working in concert. And the government traditionally has turned over a lot of that responsibility to the, the company. So if the company, like BP did back in 2010, wants to undercount how much is really coming out because eventually they might get fined based on how much oil is leaking, then that causes a real problem and they can spend years and years trying to make this thing smaller than it really is. So quickly, do we have any idea how much is being leaked, like on a daily basis, how many gallons? Or it's we... debatable and there's different numbers out there, but it looks like uh, there's an independent guy named Ian McDonald who says it's about 100 barrels a day, which works out to about 4,000 gallons a day, which is a lot more than the 10 gallons a day that Taylor had been saying, but a lot less than this new number of 30,000 gallons that had been thrown out there recently. Are we close at all to seeing it sealed? Well, there's crews out there as we speak now because the federal government has taken over, the Coast Guard has taken over, they are out there as we speak and we'll see because they're doing something that they tried back in 2008 and it didn't work. Okay. I know you'll keep us informed. I'll be on it. All right. Thanks a lot, David. Don, over to you. RTA, what's shaking over there? Lots of things. Actually, um, about a year and a half ago, December of 2017, the RTA approved the Strategic Mobility Plan, and that is the way they're looking at all of their services, from ferries to streetcars to buses, to improve for the future. Some of this stuff, you said it first, it's called the Future Watch segment. Some of it's way, way, way into the future. Um, for instance, adding a ferry service between Canal Street and Gretna sometime between 2023 and 2027, that's in the horizon, and then also Ferry Street between Canal Street and Poland Avenue in conjunction with the cruise ship terminal, that, get this, between 2028 and 2040. Mm -hmm. So that's way, way, way down the road. Currently there, there is ferry service just between Lower Algiers and Chalmette, that's the only ferry that accommodates vehicles, and then also between Canal Street and Algiers. Um, both of those ferries are operational. Um, last year, they saw ridership of just under a million people. On the Will those ferries of the future carry vehicles? Or? That's a great question. Okay. There's still ferries of the future, so I can't okay. answer. Right. I don't have my crystal ball okay. for that one yet. Okay. Um, for the streetcars, ridership in 2018 was about 7.7 .7 million. The, RTA is currently looking at a feasibility study to see about increasing the speed of the route along Canal Street between Carrollton and the riverfront. Doing that, they would eliminate some turnarounds and to vehicular traffic to be able to eliminate some of the stops mm -hmm. the streetcar has to make and also have ticket collectors at the two highest passenger use stops during rush time. Um, it would make that route take 12 minutes less time than it currently takes to get travelers to and from. They're also looking at a pilot program for buses for um, hospitality industry workers, kind of for that overnight shift. Are there enough people so that they can get home? Um, Something else, they're in the procurement process for selecting, I need to look at my notes for this one or I will get these mm -hmm. words wrong, the construction manager at risk contractor who will help with the redesign of the Canal Street Ferry Terminal. They should have that contractor selected by April um, and then that'll take about six months to work on the design plan. Construction should start in the fourth quarter of this year. It will take two years to totally redo the Canal Street Ferry Terminal. Um, it, it should be a project in conjunction with the Audubon Aquarium, Audubon Institute and the Aquarium for passenger or pedestrian access over the train tracks there and access to the ferry. Um, another st feasibility study for upgrading and extending existing rail lines, the big ones, um, we're talking Canal, Rampart and St. Claude and St. Charles, um, to speed them up mm -hmm. and also maybe extend them out.
Okay, of adding ownership. any other streetcar lines? Or Not basically yet. Sort of staying where, where, Stay where, where we are with Staying that? where we are for now. There are no new streetcar lines on the horizon. Um, and because of the construction at of the Four Seasons at the base of Canal Street, the Julia Street streetcar and the Poitras Street streetcar line are both, those stations are both closed. Okay. It's amazing there was a time when both ferries and streetcars seemed like modes of transportation that were belonged to the past. Mm -hmm. and, now, and now we're talking about bicycles <laughs> and ferries and streetcars again. Another major thing going on with RTA, if I could chime in mm -hmm. on this sure. one, is that um, since about uh, 2008 or so, the, the RTA has basically been run by a private company called Transdev, mm -hmm. and there's been, for most of that time period, essentially only one employee of the actual RTA. The rest have been private company employees. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've had a contract that was, five-year contract was extended, but it's going to run out um, at the end of August, and they are in the process of uh, having other companies compete for the new contract. Um, so there could be like a big management change coming up for that agency, or they might just Stay keep the same are. company. But but what is definitely going to happen is that this new contract is going to bring a lot of the top management positions into like basically city government. They would be under hmm. the city serv civil service. Hmm. Okay, so, well we'll see how that moves along. Yeah. Then. All righty, Dawn, we're going to stick with hats. you. Yes, we are. <laughs> She's going to put her sports hat on right yeah, now. Okay, so we heard today that the head coach of LSU basketball has been suspended. Will Wade suspended indefinitely as of today uh, for his involvement uh, in an investigation that involves, we're talking really about the middleman involved in paying players to pay in the, play in the NCAA. Will Wade was heard on a tape released yesterday talking about a player likely to, he was talking about the Smart deal, likely a deal to get J Javante Smart. This is, of course, at a time when LSU is ranked higher than they've been ranked in years, mm -hmm. doing better than they've done in years. Uh, for now, their assistant head coach will be the interim head coach. LSU takes on Vanderbilt tomorrow night at home at 7.30, so it will be. That's for the SEC title, if somebody is, is it? Yeah. Do we uh, know? No, not for the SEC title. No, but for the regular, but for the, if they win, they would clinch the regular season title, right. and then okay. there would be the tournament. So okay. they're doing the better tournament. than they've done, what is it, in 15 years? I think yeah, it's 15 years. A good season. And that the much thing I know. That's, that's ironic about the timing on this is that I believe the wiretaps were from 2017. This is a long-standing investigation. So this is coming out now right when LSU is having this success that they haven't had in a while. That and and... It's important to point out that Will Wade isn't under investigation. Right. He's been subpoenaed by the FBI, but it's really the, the middlemen in these deals. He's been subpoenaed along with Arizona's head coach. Right. So mm -hmm. this Christian Dawkins is the middleman, and he's facing charges of bribery. And that's why there are subpoenas that reportedly have gone to the Arizona coach and to Will Wade. But then they get caught in the wiretap. And so they're not doing anything illegal, but they would be violating NCAA rules if they're offering things of value mm -hmm. to a player or his family. Aside and that's, from college scholarships. Right. And that's the thing that's so, I think, powerful about what came out with the wiretap transcript is that he's saying, not only using the word offer, which people have focused on, but he's saying the offer is, quote, tilted toward taking care of the mom, taking care of the kid. Mm -hmm. He didn't get enough, talking about smart, didn't get enough of the piece of the pie in the deal. So well, it, it makes it clear we that will, we're not talking about a scholarship. Okay. Wade well, isn't we will talking see where yet. This goes. The university just said indefinite okay. suspension. All right. Well, that's unfortunate for the team, and we wish the team all the luck. Okay. Errol, over to you. We want to hear what Gail Benson has to say about um, well, the team. The, yeah, this is kind of a, a spontaneous moment at the Rex Ball that she happened to be there, and uh, she was spotted, and we just like, like did an interview. And during the course of the conversation, it was pointed out, and it's true, that the most common sort of masker you saw on Mardi Gras was a blind referee. Right. Mm -hmm. Blind referees were all over the place, and including on the floats. And so we asked her uh, about that. Okay. Let's take a look. Well, I'll tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring this up, but walking around the quarter today, the most common costume I saw was people dressed as blind referees. Uh, you know, they, they got the sunglasses on and they got the stick. So many people, so many people are still touched by that and, 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 and can't get past it. How are you dealing with it? You know, I feel like we need to move on. We lost the game and we just need to move on. We're getting ready for training camp now. We're doing a lot of recruiting now. And so I'm looking forward to training camp, moving on and winning in Miami. I mean, in, uh, yes, in Miami, like we did the first Super Bowl. That's where we were. But you got to feel proud 
the way the city reacted and especially that Super Bowl Sunday where we had our own event and the spirit of New Orleans and the, and the passion they had for the Saints. I don't think any other city could have done that. No, I don't think so either. I was so touched that everybody still talks about it. And I feel like we got more publicity from not being in the Super Bowl than if we would have been in. So it was great. She probably got the publicity. We right. didn't get the trophy though, and so that's. Well, she ultimately she got a trophy that day. It was Dave Bernard, the but, meteorologist. Yeah, they Dave gave her Fox, sort of. A, her a, we got Rob Trophy. Yeah, she was a guy who they great. gave her a, a mock trophy, but uh, but, but yeah. Uh, People still talk about this. I mean, anyway, oh, yeah, anyway you, not, go. you know, it's not going to go away. Yet, yeah, you know, and it was prevalent during, during Carnival, and maybe I could think about three or four crews that had floats right. depicting it also. And I had people come up. I wore a Saints jersey on one of the days out of the parades, just to, and I had people from out of town come up to me and just like, the first thing, oh, you guys got robbed. <laughs> and, oh, so right. people outside of New Orleans are still thinking about it. I feel like every Falcons fan's ears perked up when she made the comment of we should just move on. Like, well. <laughs> Well, saying that the whole time. But it's Falcons probably fans. really good advice. We now look to the future and want a successful season next year. And um, good advice from Mrs. Benson, probably. Okay, Errol, time to look ahead. Yeah, talking about the Falcons, you go. Okay, that's a different. <laughs> <idea. laughs> you got them rattled on. <laughs> okay, I'm rattled. Um, a, a very important referendum coming up, and that is a, a millage reallocation that will really allocate some existing millage money to parks, the city park and Ottoman Park, and in 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 into Nord into the Parkway Commission, um, and it's, uh, that election is is going to be May fourth, and it's uh, it's going to be one of these low turnout elections, but it's, I think it's going to be very important, especially for City Park, right. which doesn't have any get any city funds right. uh, despite its name. And this will be the first time that yes. it would be with this. Yeah. Okay, David. Speaking of elections, we're waiting to hear if Mike Yenny is going to run for re-election in Jefferson Parish. There was a poll that came out just recently showing him in the low teens behind Cynthia Lee Shang and John Young, and well behind, so uh, he's not committing yet whether mm -hmm. he's going to run. Okay. I'm going to put my basketball hat on again. All I never right. wear it, but um, two local teams are competing tomorrow in Lake Charles for the state championship, not against each other, two separate divisions, but uh, local people can root on De La Salle and Country Day High School tomorrow, both as they go for the state championship in basketball. Best of luck to them both. Well, I know uh, we are, and probably other newsrooms are, gearing up for this uh, next session of the Louisiana mm -hmm. legislature, which starts next month, and uh, one of the things, you know, we and I'm sure lots of folks will be following our what are they going to do about hotel taxes right. locally here and also getting money for roads, sewage and water board infrastructure, things like that. Big issues. Yeah. All right, guys, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.